Welcome to the Ghostly Gallery podcast, a place where we explore the world of horror in film, literature, and popular culture. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our program. My name is Bruce Markison, and as always, I'm joined by our producer and co-host, uh, Tracy Asteria. Tracy, welcome to the program. How you been? I've been doing great, Bruce. How about you? I know it's nice to see the sunshine here from Nova Scotia. It's been a while. <laughs> It's nice here as well. It's it's getting hot again. It's it's feeling like summer, even though we're moving into September. And we're fast approaching the fall. You know, we have some topics we want to talk about, uh, including the fact that you have seen the new film. Well, maybe not that new anymore. The Last Voyage of the Demeter. Yes. Uh, also, I want to talk about a recent horror and sci-fi expo that I went to in central New York at uh, Vernon Downs. But we're going to do that on future show because today's guest, I want to give him as much time as possible to talk. He's always got a lot of interesting things to say. And today our guest is Edward G. Pettit. Edward is the Sunstein Senior Manager of Public Programs at the Rosenbach Museum and Library, which is located in Philadelphia. Uh, Ed's an expert on Edgar Allan Poe. He's the man who also created the very popular online programs. Uh, Sundays with Dracula was the first one, followed by Sundays with Frankenstein. Both of these examined in depth the famed books written by Bram Stoker and Mary Shelley, respectively. Uh, Ed, it's been a while since we've talked. Uh, you were in Cooperstown, where I reside, about a year ago, but it's it's great to uh, have a chance to talk to you, hear your voice. Welcome. How you been? I've been great. Hi, Bruce. Hi, Tracy. Nice to meet you. Um, nice yeah, last time I saw you, Bruce, you gave me a ghost tour in Cooperstown. <laughs> yeah. So, and what a surprise that was, because we were, my wife and I are doing a little tour, and we're near Cooperstown. I'm like, Oh my gosh, I could, we could go stay near there. I could meet Bruce Markison finally. And you were given a ghost tour that night. And just by chance, I was actually wearing my Sundays with Frankenstein shirt that day. Like that was a plan. <laughs> I put that shirt on before I thought uh, that we were going and kind of, so it was, it was great to meet you and it was a great tour. So yeah. you're really good at that. Well, I, I appreciate that. You compared me to Rod Serling, which uh, oh, I certainly take yeah. that as a compliment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and even though, you know, I've listened to all your Sundays with Dracula and your Sundays with Frankenstein programs and greatly enjoyed those in-depth looks at these gothic classics, I've never really asked you where your interest in gothic literature began. Where did this start? How far back does it go? You know, it probably goes, it probably goes my whole life, but in a way that I think my interest in gothic and horror stuff, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it starts with movies. It starts with movies before it starts with, with literature and especially old movies and watching them on TV as a kid. And I know that you, you know, you've mentioned the, the, you know, the Abbott and Costello movies, not just the horror ones, but I think the other ones you like too. And I watched those as a kid. I, I probably saw the Abbott and Costello movies and like meet Frankenstein, meet Jekyll and Hyde, meet the mummy, like those, probably before I saw the horror movies that the monsters came out of actually. Um, mm. And uh, so like that stuff interested me as a kid. And then I, you know, after, and I, just kind of being in a, uh, you know, the whole pop culture monster, th I had, Mego monster, you know, dolls as a kid. Um, my brother made the Aurora models and that whole, you know, culture kind of, I think, awakened the interest in me. And then when I was really old enough to like, hey, this is stuff that I could read too, as I became a big reader, um, I started reading everything I could. I've, I've read the, the scholastic published version of Dracula, which was actually abridged. Um, uh, and uh, I had collections of stories in the library. Uh, at some point, I became aware of Edgar Allan Poe. Um, and as a teen, I tried to read. Well, I did. I read some Stephen King novels, but I, I wasn't a big Stephen King fan as a kid. You know, I was a big fan of James Herbert. 
British horror writer. Did you ever read any hmm. James Herbert books? I loved Herbert yeah. books in the 70s. Um, oh, wow. The, uh, the Rats, The Spear, The Fog, The Dark, that was like a one that I really love. Um, he's well known in England as, as, a, as a horror writer, not nearly as well known in the US, but in that horror boom, that horror paperback boom that happened in the 1980s, um, I was I was 13 years old in 1980. The 1980s are my teenage years. And so like those books were, they were publishing everything then. And I discovered mm -hmm. those. It wasn't until college that I realized that not all horror stories were Gothic. And I kind of learned what Gothic literature was that, you know, Gothic was a kind of horror. And I started then to read more of the literature. And it wasn't until college that I read Frankenstein, um, and then I finally got to read the non-scholastic abridged Dracula. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I have those books that I, that I had read then. Um, uh, so it was that kind of, I know that's all the answers I give are going to be those long answers. <laughs> I can start <laughs> as a kid doing stuff and then I start reading and it's a path. It's that, it's that journey you wind up on, um, it wasn't one of those like lightning moments like, oh, I was sick a weekend and there was a copy of Dracula on the shelf. I, I don't have those kinds of stories. Everything was that kind of journey towards discovering things that um, one leads to the next. You know what I mean? Oh, wow. No, I think that's amazing. Um, I was just wondering, um, before we get really into the questions that we have for you today, <clears throat> would you be able to just talk a little bit about the Rosenbach Museum and Library, just for those of us who aren't as familiar with it? If you sure, I, it's 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 the dream job that I have. Uh, I do public programs for the Rosenbach Museum and Library. It is a mm -hmm. rare book collection. Uh, an historic house in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, uh, founded by the Rosenbach brothers, Philip and A.S.W. Rosenbach. Uh, A.S.W. Rosenbach, or Dr. Rosenbach, was a book collector, but more importantly, he was a book dealer. He was the most famous book seller, book dealer in, in, of old and antiquarian books uh, in the United in the world, really, for the first half of the 20th mm -hmm. century. Everybody who was into that kind of field knew who he was. He he would pay the highest prices for manuscripts and rare books, and he'd make sure he get all the publicity. And he created uh, a great business doing this, but also his own personal collection. And when the brothers died, they left the collections and the house to be a museum. And um, it was the rest of the company stock and whatever their personal collection. Philip, the brother, did fine arts and antiques, um, and, and Dr. R did the books. Um, mm -hmm. And they left it in the in the mid 1950s as uh, the for the public, and uh, the Rosenbach has you know opened shortly after that you know to the general public, and has been open ever since. Um, it is, it is a wide ranging collection. Um, uh, we're 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 famous for having we have a complete manuscript for James Joyce's Ulysses. Um, oh wow. We have a great Robert Burns collection. We have a great Lewis Carroll collections. One of the greatest Lewis Carroll collections in the world. Um, uh, we also have, but we also have Bram Stoker's Notes for Dracula. Um, and we still collect and, mm -hmm. and, and the collection still grows. As a matter of fact, Bram Stoker's Notes for Dracula weren't acquired to 1970, um, you know, hmm. long after the Rosenbach brothers um, were gone. And, um, and so we, we we still get things, but it's a it's a it's a, a lot. There's a lot of market history, a lot of founding father documents in our in our collections. Oh, so really? there's an awful lot of things, and I get to do programs based on things in our collections, which is which is an absolute dream. And that's how I got to do the shows that I do because these are parts of our collections mm -hmm. that I then created digital shows around. Oh my gosh, that's fascinating. I mean, I go to work and like, I mean, I just pull, you know, I can just pull things off the shelves that are, you know, I can remember uh, getting the job there when I first started and I spent a whole Saturday just on my own time going through cases and pulling books hmm. out and 
discovering that like I open like I pull out Percy Shelley's uh, uh, book of poems Queen Mab and I open it up and it says you know to Lee Hunt from the author and I'm like oh, oh. <laughs> you know, and those kind of things it's you know we, we have so much so many wonderful uh, books and manuscripts a lot of Charles Dickens letters I do a lot of Dickens work Mm. We have a show on the Pickwick Papers that's running monthly now. Um, we have manuscript pages from the Pickwick Papers and all kinds of stuff. So it's every every day of work is is a dream like that. Oh my gosh, it would be. It sounds are, like a dream. <laughs> and we are open to the public. This is not the kind of collection that you need to be, you know, some kind of you know accredited researcher with an institution to come and look at our things. We are open to the general public anyone can go on the Rosenbach's website, rosenbach.org, and set an appointment to come in and be in our reading room and see some of the things that we have and look at them yourself. Mm. So anybody can do that. Oh, wow. Mm. That's a wonderful resource. And it's a place I want. I love Philadelphia. Been there many times, but have not been to the Rosenbach and definitely want to add that to the list. You mentioned, Ed, that Sundays with Dracula was very much an offshoot of the Rosenbach. 27 weeks, chapter by chapter, you go through Bram Stoker's uh, iconic novel. I believe it was motivated because it started in 2020, and I believe it was motivated by the pandemic, right? That's where it began. I, I do public programs, which before the pandemic meant I'd put a program on at the Rosenbach and people would come to the Rosenbach and it's small. We can like at the most we can fit in. It's like 50, 60 people for like a talk or something like that. Um, but when the pandemic hit, um, I had the good fortune of keeping my job. Uh, <laughs> mm. You know, like they were willing to pay me to come up with things at home. And I went online. We do a lot of literary courses too tied to our collection. So I moved all our courses online. <laughs> And then I have to do something to justify the fact that I get paid. Um, so I came up with um, Sundays with Dracula um, uh, because we, ha we have a bunch of edition first editions of, 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 of Stoker's Dracula and things related and other vampire things related. And we have Stoker's notes to Dracula. And I thought I would put together a show. We'll do one chapter a week with myself and a co-host and we'll just talk and mm. And went up 28 weeks because we did because the chapters the book is 27 chapters long we did an after show but what's so fortunate about dracula and how it worked out so well was that not only is the book 27 chapters but the book because it's dated in letters and diary entries the book itself is about 27 weeks long it's you know from may 3rd and it ends the first week in november that's 27 weeks so we got to do a show that kind of took the same amount of time as it took for the characters to do it as well. Um, and, uh, and it was a big hit and it worked really well. And it's over, I, th it, I mean, it's over 60 hours of content that, <laughs> that I created and you, and it's all still available. It's on the Rosenbeck's uh, YouTube channel. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and because of the, you know, because I was stuck home doing it, uh, I had a co I had a signature cocktail for every show that I came up <laughs> with myself. Um, and I mean, talk about like I talk about my dream. I mean, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. Like I get to talk about books with a cocktail, smoking my pipe from home <laughs> um, <laughs> with access to this glorious collection at the Rosenbeck. And this is what I get to do for a living. Um, it's it's a it's a great deal of fun which is how i approach it like um i want i want these shows to not just be um not just be you know you know long lectures on you know things in the books it's it's a lot of give and take and a lot of fun um as well as you know learning about the books and, and the authors that we present so and then when that finished we go let's keep this going and so we did uh we did a we did frankenstein we have we have a first edition of frankenstein in our collection we have um lots of related things to that from letters and, and manuscripts and percy shelley we have other we have letters from mary shelley and other books of hers we have uh you know polidori's the vampire which was also inspired that same summer mary was inspired to write frankenstein we have the the manuscript draft manuscript of Prometheus, which is a Byron poem that he wrote 
that same summer that the that Percy and Mary were were visiting. Um, so we did Frankenstein, and then we moved on to to be we, we stayed gothic, and then I did Sundays with Jane Eyre. Mm-hmm. Um, but it still it wasn't monsters. It was well, unless you call unless you count Rochester as a monster, and he, may, he very well <laughs> may be you know locking his you know poor mad wife up in the attic. Um, sorry, spoiler. Um, and um, and then I moved on to actually Jane Austen, and we did we did a show on Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. But we now we've moved to Mondays, and that was Austen Mondays because I realized, oh my gosh, I've given up every Sunday of my life doing a show, and uh, so I ended. Now we do Monday, night, and we'll we'll continue doing these. We have we have one I'll talk about at the end of today's talk. Oh, wow. Ed, where does Dracula rate among your favorite books of Gothic literature? Is it at the top, near the top? What what what's the best for you? It's definitely my favorite vampire book, and as it should be, because it because it is so rich. Because even though there's other vampire stories before it, it it kind of became the er vampire text. You know, the one thing that every it kind of absorbed everything before it and every vampire story written after dracula is in some way a kind of has some kind of conversation with it like it can't ignore dracula so that's my favorite vampire book but if you want to talk all you know gothic especially i mean it's you know i mean i can't i can't have a life without you know without poe without edgar Allan poe uh le Fanu's stories uh, Robert Louis Stevenson's Jekyll and Hyde, um, Island of Dr. Moreau. Mm-hmm. I'm also a big fan of the ghost story tradition, especially M.R. James. So those kind of things, gothic, I mean, not just vampire, but but if you're asking gothic horror in general. Uh, and, and, and also it sounds like, hey, Ed, are you still stuck in the 19th century? I am stuck in, <laughs> I'm stuck in the 19th century. I can't get out of the 19th century. That's where I live and um viewer I mean, people look me up online i have a long beard i look like i'm from the 19th century um that's i'm i'm more interested in older gothic and horror than i am in newer works even though there's some brilliant authors out there well you might look like a 19th century character but you speak like a modern day man that's one of the things i like about you 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 speak plain english plain language uh you make it very understandable and i think that's one of the the really top strengths of the programs that you've done and one of the reasons we wanted to have you on this program talking specifically about dracula about stoker's novel do you have a favorite character in the book? Is it is it Lucy? Is it Mina Van Helsing? Dracula himself? Who is it's, it? it? It's interesting when 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 you do so much with the work, so much study, and so and and really dive into it so long, the characters really do become real people in your mind. Like you don't mean them to be, and I know they're not real, or were they? Um, but so it's. It's a, it's a different for that book and then for other things that I love too. Um, it's it's really like you're not like I can't even answer it as a favorite character in a sense. It's I answer it as almost like who do I like the best? You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And and it's Mina. I mean Mina is is the greatest character in the book and she's the engine that 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 gets to drive them. Um, she's more important than any of the others, even Van Helsing in a sense. I mean, I think if Van Helsing doesn't come along, Mina would have figured out a way to mm-hmm. battle Dracula. <laughs> um, uh, Renfield is completely fascinating too. Like I, you know, I, I just as, a, as, as, that's more of as a character clearly. Um, but I could go down the list of them all and I'm like, oh yeah, Seward's a real jerk. I hate that guy. Um, <laughs> you know, like, like, but they're all, they've all become almost personal reactions yeah. in, over time because, uh, you know, I've read it so much and done so much work with it, especially with the notes. You know, I remember you being somewhat critical of Van Helsing, although he's very knowledgeable and he's crucial to the book. You know, he does say some, I guess, stupid, condescending things from time to time. And, and you and some of your, your guest hosts were critical of that. He is. And, you know, at the end of the day, Van Helsing is a religious zealot. Um, at the end of the day, that is his, you know, that's his point of view. 
and he's battling, you know, he's using, you know, his religion, his Christian religion to battle the forces of evil. And it, it, that's, that's harder for me to get behind. Um, but one of the fascinating things about Van Helsing in the novel is that he's, he's kind of, he's not, he's, he's like the mirror image of Dracula, which means that he's not just the opposite, like, but, but that they're also kind of alike in a lot of unusual ways. Like they're both, they're both, those two characters are both the foreigners who were, who are kind of in England. Um, they, they both kind of control tr or at least try to control people around him, you know, Van Helsing, you know, with this hypnotism and, and is, you know, the, he has a lot of, um, he makes a lot of animal sounds in the novel. Like Stoker <laughs> constantly says like he hissed um, and things like that. Um, and, and I think that's unconscious on, on Stoker's part, but it certainly fits his character that, you know, Dracula as the kind of beast from you know beast from the you know east invading the west and mm -hmm. and van helsing you know his his nemesis um they're they're both kind of animal like in a way and also giant brilliant here's here's something interesting van helsing constantly describes dracula as this he, he describes him as having this like um like he's got this enormously developed intelligence but he's still kind of lower down on the evolutionary scale. And, but, but when I read it, especially from a very con modern contemporary perspective, that's how I see Van Helsing. <laughs> like he's, he's brilliant, but he uses, he believes everything. He goes, he gives them a lecture and he's like, oh, and remember, and you know, he tells them like, everything is believable. And you know, there used to be this great spider in a church that got, you know, we like lived for like thousands of years and, and I'm like, Van Helsing would believe in Bigfoot. Like he would believe in anything that came down the pike with no evidence. Mm. And, and that's kind of, I, uh, you know, I, I think they're kind of the same, except that Van Helsing doesn't want innocent people to die and Dracula does. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Dracula's bad. And, but, but also that first four chapters of the novel Dracula is mesmerizing and yeah, I know he's evil, but there it's just, you know, I don't know if I want to have dinner with him, but, I, <laughs> but I, but that, that experience is certainly, you know, uh, fascinating to witness and that character, he and then he goes away. Um, then Stoker takes Dracula out of the book and he only has, he only has lines, like a few lines later. Um, uh, I want to see more. I actually want to see more of Dracula in the, you know, the the back two thirds of that novel that more yeah. than I see it. So, Ed, what do you think it is about Stoker's writing that is so lasting? It's kept our interest. It's now 126 years after this was first published. What what keeps us drawn to this? Well, for Stoker, it's the best book he ever wrote. And I mean, and, and, he, and he wrote, I don't know, a dozen books, something like that, maybe a little more. Um, but it's the only book that he spent seven years writing and researching and doing. And, and this is what we have the evidence for at the Rosenbach, which fascinates me about is we have his notes. We don't have a manuscript. Um, there's a typescript of Dracula that exists, um, the, the final typescript. And that is in the Museum of Popular Culture in Seattle. Um, uh, the late Paul Allen, who's one of the Microsoft founders, had purchased that and he created this museum and they have it there. But like almost nobody can see it. Like they're really strict about it. Not the Rosenbach. We'll show you Bram Stoker's notes <laughs> like anybody. So um, but the, he spent so much time crafting this novel and it's it's evident in the text. Um, but why it is still popular is not actually as much to do with how great this book is because in, in that, if you think there's a lot of great books that nobody reads anymore. I mean, there really are. Um, mm -hmm. But Dracula, because it enters this great popular culture first on the stage and then in movies, 
and and the figure himself kind of becomes so big that now whenever someone wants to go back and say like yeah but i want to know like how vampire started or what it's you know you can go to dracula it's become that text even though there's earlier ones than that it's still become almost like the bible for vampires that's the book you go to to really learn what vampires are about because mm-hmm. stoker does that he doesn't i don't think he sets out that's not his goal but he winds up creating this taxonomy of vampires you know this like this is what vampires are this is how like these are all their powers these are all their weaknesses and and because he does that he creates you know this and he doesn't give us everything we don't get the origin story of dracula um Mm -hmm. which which everybody wants um but he does give us so much about vampires that are still and, and some of that stuff stoker invented uh, some he takes in folklore, some he takes in other fiction, and some he invents himself, and he kind of creates this idea of a vampire that still exists. So why is it so popular? Because when people want to know, you know, how this started, in a sense, it, it, it doesn't chronologically start with Dracula, but for all intents and purposes, what we think of as vampires really do start with, with Dracula. Before we move on to Frankenstein, uh, Tracy, did you have anything you wanted to ask about Stoker and Dracula? Well, I, I do have just a really off topic question. Um, and, and this would be, this, <laughs> and this could be for both Edward and for you, Bruce, but I was just curious, what are your thoughts? Do you think vampires actually exist in real life? Well, I will only answer them if you will answer, Tracy, as well. <laughs> um, I don't. I, I, I am one of those. I'm not even a skeptic. I just don't believe in the supernatural. Um, okay. And, uh, be, and, but I think because of that, I can enjoy it. I think if I really believed that there were vampires or even ghosts or any kind of supernatural force that might be evil Mm -hmm. i think i probably wouldn't be able to read and enjoy this stuff like it would be like that's too terrifying of a universe for me um and i don't think that's why i don't believe in it i just Mm -hmm. i I just don't and but but that's a whole nother show clearly um (laughs) but you know yeah i i don't and although there are although i recognize that there are um vampire subcultures and that there are Mm -hmm. people who genuinely identify with this and live their life that way and you know and and that's awesome i'm glad they could they they can do that philadelphia actually philadelphia has a as a uh has has a you know a a vampire community in it um Hmm. it's not quite as big as a place like new orleans but it really exists in philadelphia and there are people that 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 live their lives that way um is Tucker Christine part of that group? He's not. Tucker is not <laughs> a vampire. I can. Well, I don't know. I've no. I've seen him in the day. You know. Well, that depends on what vampire rules we go by. Yeah. Um, you now his 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 blood is 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 a good whiskey. So. <laughs> now, Ed, you may not know this, but Tracy is a ghost hunter. That's something that yeah, she does do. uh, when she's yeah. not at work or doing this program. So I know Tracy definitely believes in ghosts. What about vampires, Tracy? You believe her? Well, you know, I've always believed that anything is possible. I don't have any evidence and I've never come across any actual evidence of vampire existence, but I, I think the possibility is out there. Now I have done a little bit of research on the community that you're talking about in Philadelphia. And I think, I did look at something for the New Orleans area as well. And, you know, the the people that live that kind of life and really believe in it, I, I truly believe that they're not actual vampires per se. Mm-hmm. But um, I, I, I think the possibility is out there. The world is always changing and you're always discovering new things. So you just never know. You just mm-hmm. never know. If, if you know if it happens that we discover that it's true well we have we have all the information we know to combat them if they're going to be you know evil <laughs> yes exactly 
<laughs> what about yourself, Bruce? What are your thoughts? I think there are definitely people who believe that they're vampires and they probably mm -hmm. do a lot of the things that we see vampires do in books and on TV and films. Uh, are they supernatural creatures? No, I would, I would agree with that on that one. But mm -hmm. no, I do think there are people, they believe that they are vampires and they definitely live that kind of a life. Absolutely. Here's the great, I mean, this is fiction, but, 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 but here's the great story that deals with that issue too. And that's George Romero's vampire movie, Martin, one of my favorite movies mm. in which the lead character believes he's a vampire. So he has to go kill people and drink their blood. And, um, and it's a fascinating movie, um, creepy and weird. Um, it's, uh, it's one of the few non-zombie movies that George Romero made. Um, and uh, it's a brilliant movie. And, but it deals with that issue. Like, what if somebody believes they're a vampire? Mm. How does that work in life? Yeah. I recommend Martin. So for those who haven't seen it. So. Yeah, I have not, I have not that seen that one. Well, you no, me neither. That. Yeah, that's yeah. it's really good. I showed it to my I I I I, I taught for a long time, uh, college, and um, uh, I showed that to the students one time, and they were just like they were so like horrified, like like this was like really un it was un really uncomfortable for them <laughs> to yeah. watch this movie. Um, it's a it's a strange one, and but really worth watching because it's it's not only a movie about the characters in it and the story that it tells. It's, it, it's also a kind of movie about vampires and about what we think about vampires and the tradition of vampires and all that. So you know, it's, it's a really fascinating movie. Oh, awesome. Thank you. So after the success of Sundays with Dracula, you move on to Sundays with Frankenstein. Uh, again, well, not necessarily a chapter by chapter. I think you did two chapters at a time. We did. As we I had recall. to speed it up a little, yeah. Yeah. Uh, very different from Stoker, written in a much different way, but still a great literary achievement for Mary Shelley. In particular, Ed, what do you like about the book? Wow, Frankenstein. If you had asked me, I guess, you know, uh, years ago, what my favorite book was, I probably would have said Frankenstein. I'm not quite sure it's still there, even though it's it's still my, like, of the greatest books that I think are there. Frankenstein's one of them. I think it was the book I actually taught the most um, mm -hmm. in college. Um, it is, it's, a, I love monster stories. And Frankenstein is the monster story that changes the monster narrative. It's the first sympathetic monster. Um, and in that the book is about, and some of the films get this and some don't. Um, in the book, he is, He's this brilliant, you know, creation that is rejected by his creator. And even when he does horrible things, all the sympathy is still with him um, for most readers. And that's a very different conception of a monster from monsters that had come before it. Um, monsters before Frank, before the 19th century and before Frankenstein were always evil or they were some kind of monstrous, you know, uh, uh, growth out of nature that is evil because it is so, you know, uh, uh, um, large, ugly, and frightening. Um, but monsters are always evil. And Mary Shelley writes a book where it's, he's a monster and monster is used all throughout the text to describe him. Uh, and he does monstrous things. Um, and yet, you know, Victor, his creator, Victor Frankenstein, is more the, you know, monster in that novel uh, mm. than the creature is. Mm. And ever since that monster story, there's all kinds of sympathetic monsters. Um, if, if you look at a book like Dracula, in which there's, I mean, Dracula is a beast, and he is, and but he's an evil beast, and, and there's no sympathy for him in most of that book except for Mina, Mina has pity on him. Um, and, but, but even a, a book like that written, like, you know, 80 years later, 
then since then there's all kinds of sympathetic portrayals of dracula and all monsters kind of fall into that then after after frankenstein that it is more interesting to have a monster that you might have sympathy for or you can understand its dilemma and its plight um and you know uh so and frankenstein's the book that begins that whole move i mean there's i mean there's other reasons i mean frankenstein is an is an absolutely you know brilliant brilliant novel you know by you know mary shelley i mean 18 year old you know uh, who who comes up with the idea for this it's a monster novel it's a scientific novel it's a necrological novel. You know, it's a novel about death and how we deal with death. It's a religious novel. It's a birth novel. It's an education novel. It's a mythic novel. It's a commentary on Milton's Paradise Lost. It's a commentary on the French Revolution. It's a commentary on all these other men in Mary Shelley's life, including her husband, Percy, um, and how they create and what they do with their creations and how their relationships kind of are influenced by the kind of romantic creator that they are. I mean, there's so, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of the richest books I've ever read and it's a monster story. <laughs> so <laughs> like you can't go wrong with that. And um, uh, so getting to do a show where we did, I think 15, uh, it was only 15 weeks. It's a shame I go do 15 weeks. Of That's a show I wish I could have done a chapter at a time, but you know, that was just the logistics of figuring out, you know, how to do these shows. And if I could ever revisit that, I would do Frankenstein a chapter at a time. Oh, wow. When I first read Shelley's book, it was in college. It was part of a Gothic literature course, which I absolutely loved. Oh, that's good. Yeah. And I was struck by how different the monster was from the Karloff, Cheney, Glenn Strange portrayals that we see from Universal Studios. Now you had mentioned yeah. earlier that you first watched the movies, then came the book. So when you first read Shelley's book, were you really surprised like I was about Shelley's description and characterization of this monster? It didn't seem like the same creature at all. Definitely, it did take me by surprise in the sense that like, I knew that the book was gonna be really different. Like I knew that about it, but I hadn't, but in reading it, it, it 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 really drives home that it's you know it's the like that he's that that the creature is brilliant and eloquent and uh and has been rejected um of those of that like the rejection theme is still big in in even the universal films i mean frankenstein and and especially the bride of frankenstein all the sympathy is for the creature i think james whale understood that entirely james whale understood that that's what the book was about mm -hmm. and that's one of the reasons why there's such great adaptations because Whale gets something from that text and and those this is what it's really about it doesn't have to follow the story if you know what it's about and um and whale really got that in his you know two frankenstein films um i was surprised by it, but uh, well, I, I, I or I wasn't surprised by it, but but it's still a revelation when you read it if you only know Frankenstein from popular culture. So yeah. he's not yeah. he's not mute, shambling around. Um, he's also not silly. He's not Frankenberry. Um, he's not <laughs> silly at all. Um, yeah. He is he is. Um, uh, uh, this kind of beautiful creature that 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 it's really hard not to identify with. Yeah. Maybe so you can clear something up for me, Ed, because I've, I've really wondered about this. When the book first comes out, 1818, I believe is the first edition, Shelley's name is not included on the cover. It's not even on the inside pages of the book. Now, was this simply because publishers feared the public would not accept a female author? Or was there some other reason for this? That's not a publisher choice. That's an author choice. Oh, um, really? Some women did publish under their own name then, but most actually did not. Jane Austen never published a novel under her own name. Um, authorship of fiction was not a respectable endeavor. Um, 
Some people did. You know, there's, a, there's a famous, you know, the, the most famous Gothic horror writer of the 18th century is late 18th century is Anne Radcliffe. And she published her books as, you know, Mrs. Radcliffe. Um, and she didn't have a, she didn't have an issue with it, but, but it's writing fiction, especially was like acting like what that's, that's not a respectable thing. Those people are horrible. Um, like back then, that's what everybody thought. If it was a book of poetry, then Mary Shelley would have been probably okay with putting her name on it. Um, but it's still, it, it, it's a novel and it's fantastical kind of fiction. So it's, it's definitely not a, a, a thing that people think is, uh, that the reading public or publishers think that is, is a, a respectable endeavor. But it's also, I think there's a personal reason Mary Shelley does not put her name on it in that so much is expected of her. She is the daughter of Mary Wollstonecraft and William Godwin, the two, you know, leading radical philosophers of the late 18th century. And um, I mean, that's really Percy's first attraction to her is like, oh, my gosh, or William Godwin's daughter um, uh, that and everybody expected great things of her. So what if the novel sucks and everybody says that it does like i i think that there's that personal thing that it's really hard to put her it's really hard for her to put her name out there it's a very risky maneuver hmm. and she doesn't um but she does dedicate the book to her father which is weird with all the things that this book says about fathers um but she dedicates it to her father and Percy Shelley actually writes the intro to it, even though he doesn't sign it. There's like a little preface to Frankenstein that Percy has actually written. Um, people at the time, because it was dedicated to William Godwin, they thought Percy Shelley wrote it. Some of them did because Shelley was known as a disciple of William Godwin, of Mary's father. Hmm. Um, they didn't think that like must have been his daughter. <laughs> They thought it must have been his disciple, Percy, who, while not a well-known writer at the time, was at least more, he was more infamous for his positions than he was for his writing. He had very little poetry actually published at the time because he couldn't get it published because he was, you know, a radical atheist uh, and, you know, adamant about it. Um, hmm. uh, but Mary, I think, is, holds her name from it because, you know, she doesn't want, now, a second edition comes out in 1824, I think it's 24 um, or 23, um, five or six years later, and her name is on it. Um, uh, and it is Mrs. by Mrs. Uh, by Mrs. Percy Shelley. Um, and uh, um, and then the third edition has her name on it as well. So it's only the first edition that she didn't have her name on it. And then the second and third edition do. Um, and that's what I think. This leads perfectly into my next question, because I wanted to ask about Percy Shelley and this theory that he wrote part of the book or all of the book. What, what's your feeling? Do you think Mary completely wrote the book start to finish? We have we have the manuscript. I mean, the manuscript exists. It's at the Bodleian Library um, uh, in England. Um, there's no debate about whether or not Mary Shelley wrote it. People do wonder about how influential Percy was in it. Okay here it is he helped her edit it and helped her shape the book they were not just not just an ordinary couple they were a creative couple mm. and she would i mean he she write when she's first inspired to write it she does and he's like do it and she does and she writes kind of a longish short story um, which we don't have, but we know from things that they've written and other thing, evidence in the manuscript that it was a smaller piece at first. And it's Percy who kind of convinces her, no, this is a longer novel and you really have a lot more here. Um, and, and she expands it. But because the manuscript exists um, in her hand, there are sometimes annotations in it from her, and it's the same hand, and sometimes by Percy and what he did is he helped her edit it and he really did help make it a better book. 
but he doesn't add enough to be a co-author. He's yeah, really, yeah. he really helps her shape her vision. Um, he was, uh, he knew enough about literature and to do that with her. And um, I think, I don't think, I don't think it wasn't, it wasn't like a partnership. It was, you know, her, you know, someone that she was in a creative relationship with that she was sharing her manuscript like every day, like she would write and she would share it with Percy and he would read it yeah, and he would yeah. let her know what he thought of it. And he was brilliant too. And yeah, he would yeah. have great ideas and he helped her kind of develop, you know, the character of Victor a little more and things like that. But he is, you know, he's, he's in, he's, he helped her edit the novel. I don't even know if in the end he becomes like in that role, that modern role we would call an editor, but he's pretty close to it. Um, and nobody reads any novel now and thinks who was the editor? Like they don't, but yeah. even though editors are involved in writing fiction <laughs> and help the authors come up with their novels and help them shape it and help them change things, nobody talks about editors, but that is, and, but that is his kind of role uh, in it. And, and all the evidence is there in the manuscript itself. Interesting. So she is unquestionably the author. This, this is not debated at all. Yeah. Like yeah. They, we even know how much he contributed. It's something like, of the whole book, you know, there's a certain like word count that he that he contributed. It's like five thousand words of like eighty thousand, or I don't know how many. I, that that's not. I mean, I don't. I'm guessing at those numbers, but it's something like that kind of thing. It's like he did. He he does write in the margin actual words, which which in a way you could say is stronger than what a modern editor would be. But it's still him helping her shape her prose is what he's doing. We continue with our guest, Edward G. Pettit of the Rosenbach Museum in Philadelphia. Ed, I wanted to talk about uh, film adaptations. Frankenstein, the, the original film from 1931 with Boris Karloff uh, is my favorite. It remains my yeah. favorite horror film of all time. I'm curious, uh, is that your favorite Frankenstein? Is it the Abbott and Costello movie? Is it something else? <laughs> um, the Abbott Costello movie is, a, is really is a great movie. It is a great comedy. It is yeah. I, Abbott Costello. I love. Um, just as I spent all of my, I can't remember if it was Friday night or sa I think it was Saturday night. There was a movie showing late, but there was also a Saturday afternoon creature double feature in Philadelphia where I grew up. Um, and I also had Dr. Shock, one of the great, you know, movie, you know, horror movie hosts. And he was the local one in Philadelphia, Dr. Shock, who kind of took his character from Zachary and adapted it in his own way. Really brilliant guy, really funny guy. And he would introduce the movies and show them. Um, but I say that because there was also on Sunday afternoons when I grew up, Adam Costello movies, like every Sunday, there was an Adam Costello movie. And it was followed by a Blondie movie, you know, Blondie and Dagwood. Oh, uh, yes. I watched all those too. And they used to upset me. Um, that, that kind of weird, like comic story where something goes wrong and poor Dagwood's got to fix everything. I always found those stressful, <laughs> but Abbott and Costello, like when things go wrong, it's hilarious. Um, and, uh, um, and actually, they're Adam Costello of Mate Frankenstein. It's actually more a movie about Dracula, right? I mean, it's really, he's the, and it's Bela Lugosi returning. And it's really about, it should have been called Adam Costello meet Dracula, because yeah. that's really who it's about, even though Frankenstein's, you know, the mo Frankenstein monster is in it. Um, uh, Wales Frankenstein is utterly brilliant, and but then I think he tops it. I think Bride is like so, like Bride of Frankenstein is a greater film, but mm -hmm. it's almost, even though they're made four years apart, you could just watch them as one film. <laughs> and it's the greatest, you know, creation uh, that's ever been done. Um, I love the Hammer uh, horror series with uh, Peter Cushing as Frankenstein and Christopher Lee as the monster. Um, I love, the, especially love those because it's a long series of movies about how much more evil can Peter Cushing get um, <laughs> in, each, in each successive, you know, Frankenstein film. Um, I also love Young Frankenstein, uh, which, which is, a, you know, it's it's not only a brilliant Frankenstein movie, it's still funny. Um, but Frankenstein's a weird thing. Unlike Dracula, um, 
there seem to be more movies. Well, I mean, with Dracula, you can get there's a lot of inspired vampire movies, you know, from Dracula. And it's the same thing with Frankenstein. There's only a few actually Frankenstein movies that I think are great. You know, the, the two whales and, and maybe the, you know, the Curse of Frankenstein, maybe maybe a couple other of the hammers. But the films that kind of deal with the same issues of Frankenstein, inspired by those ideas, like there's a, there's a great Alex Garland movie called Ex Machina um, about developing this AI creature that it's it's literally the Frankenstein story, um, but just kind of reca- reanimator. Great, you know, right. movie. Um, Edward Scissorhands. I mean, these movies that aren't Frankenstein, but they're really just telling the Frankenstein story in a different way that I tend to love those too. You know, I'm curious what you think of a movie that came out as well. It's almost 30 years now, 1994. It's the Frankenstein with Robert De Niro of all saw, people saw the as theater. the creature. What do you, what do you <laughs> think of it? I think it's pretty good. I was, a, I was a huge Brana fan. Then. I still am. I love Kenneth Brana. And, um, uh, so I was, I was excited because it was my favorite, you know, Shakespeare guy making, you know, Frankenstein, you know, the novel that I loved then. And, um, uh, it is, it is a glorious, glorious mess. It is (laughs) so watchable and it's just nuts. Um, it's, he, it goes to such extremes with, I mean, I, 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 I can't even tell you how the number of scenes where Victor isn't running across a set shouting somebody's name, you know, Elizabeth, <laughs> father, like, like over and over again. It's all that, you know, that was Brana's idea of, you know, gothic and being yeah. big like that. And it works sometimes in the film. And then, but then of course it becomes almost campy in others. Um, but, and uh, people, I, I, I'm, I'm not as, I'm kind of alone in this. I think De Niro is terribly miscast as the monster. Um, I know a lot of people that like him as, as the creature, and they, they, they think he's great. And, I, and Robert De Niro is, is clearly one of the greatest actors ever, and I don't think he does a good job at all. I think, I think he's in a different film almost, because mm. Rana comes from that classical tradition um, where it's all about all the emotion is put into the way you're speaking your lines. And De Niro comes from a tradition where it's all inside. And especially with the makeup on, I think it's like, he never, I never believe him. Like I never think, I never, I never read that as real emotion out of him. Even, the, but if you took him and put him in another film, it might read great, but it doesn't read great in this film. Hmm. And um, uh, I will say though, and uh so this could be spoilery so people can mute for a little bit but at the end when he then takes elizabeth and makes her into the bride of frankenstein that is again crazy (laughs) but also (laughs) brilliant in a way that like oh my gosh what a great turn of events that is um i am not a person that um likes fidelity when it comes to filmed adaptations i could care less if you're giving me the exact plot matter of fact i'd rather you didn't because i read the book and i read it a lot so if you're just going to film all the just going to put all the scenes on film i'm probably going to get a little bored halfway through uh, because i know everything um so i like people to take a chance you know like if somebody makes a hamlet and then he kills claudius halfway through i'd be like oh now it's interesting now I'll like <laughs> you know now i'm really interested in this um so i like people to make story changes um and especially if it really lines up with um you know what the what the story is about and can say some interesting things about it and Actually, the end of that film, I think, does have some really interesting things about the story and the way Brown does it. It's just it's just such a mess. It's yeah. It's tried to do too much. One really interesting thing about it is just how horrible looking De Niro is with all the stitching yeah. and the scars. I think he's the hardest monster to look at in the Frankenstein yeah, adaptations. I mean- I, I mean, I guess I think people probably felt that way when they saw the hammer curse of Frankenstein, you know, when, mm-hmm. you know, 
you know, when they you first and, they, and there's a big reveal. They pull off the you know, turn as you turn around or they pull off the bandages, I think. And and it's like Da-da-dum! and he's horrible looking. Um, and I think that shocked people then. There's no shock factor anymore. Um, but it is. Yeah, it's it's hard to figure out a way to portray the creature. Um because you can't just do the old, you know, Karloff Frankenstein. Um, and and if you're trying to get it too close to the book, I don't know how well that would read now. But the idea, I think, that Mary Shelley's going for is that when people look at him, it looks like a dead person who is still kind of talking. Mm-hmm. And, and for that factor, I think they, you know that gets it right in Branagh's. And also the fact that everybody in the novel looks at the creature and they're like, ah, and they run away or they throw things at him. And they're, and when you read it now, you think, oh my gosh, that's horrible. Why are you doing that? Like, he just looks awful. Why are you reacting that way? It's hard to figure out a way to portray the creature that would really shock and disgust people looking at it in nowadays. You know what I mean? Yeah. We have a few minutes remaining with Edward G. Pettit of the Rosenbach Museum. We're going to put Dracula and Frankenstein aside for a moment. Uh, we wanted to kind of look at the horror genre, uh, I guess, as a whole. And, and Tracy had a question that she wanted to ask uh, kind of in that direction. Yeah, um, I was just kind of wondering what your thoughts were on the horror genre today. Are you a fan of the modern stuff that's coming out? And if so, is there anything in particular that you're excited or looking forward to seeing that's upcoming? I probably pay attention more to to movies, but even that, Mm -hmm. it's um, I'm still stuck in my old world, you know? Um, I read some things, horror writers. I, I, I like Grady Hendrix's books that, that come out, you know, frequently mm-hmm. every year now. He's a brilliant author. Um, he was a, he was a special guest on, uh, Sundays of Dracula. Um, mm-hmm. oh, wow. uh, and, uh, I like him a lot. Another one of my special guests was Gwendolyn Keist, who, uh, who wrote a really great, um, book kind of mashing up Dracula and, Jane Eyre and set in the 1960s psychedelic, you know, you know, California. Um, uh, she's got a new book coming out. Um, so if I know people, I tend to be, I tend to go to their books, but there's that author, uh, Sylvia. Sorry, I'm going to have to stop for a sec. Grab a book. Going to look at his extensive bookshelf. It is. Sylvia Moreno Garcia, who wrote Mexican Gothic and the daughter of Dr. Moreau. Um, she's brilliant. Um, and, uh, and I like those books. Um, What's her name again? What's her name again? Sylvia Moreno Garcia. She wrote a great book called Mexican Gothic. She has another book called the daughter of Dr. Moreau. She has a brand new one out. I mean, she's releasing books more far quicker than I can get to them. Um, Oh. Like, which is once a year, because I have like, man, like I'm surround, I'm surrounded by books right now. And, um, and it's always, you know, hard to get, it's harder for me to get to newer things, especially mm-hmm. because I'm involved in all these kind of projects and creating shows for the Rosenbach and that kind of take that eats up so much of my reading time. Um, right. Horror is, is going really well. I think horror is actually even, um, uh, doing better now than it was when it boomed in say like the eighties, you know, because mm. there's a far less schlock being put out there now. And um, uh, there's just a lot of really great authors out there that, you know, it's, it's a shame that you don't find horror sections in bookstores anymore um, because they yeah. really are, you know, some, some tremendously good books what is your what is in your collection the beautiful collection that you have behind you do you have a prized book in your collection that is your favorite 
that you've acquired over the years? <laughs> this is like a tiny bit. It... There's like two rooms of books here. Um, oh my goodness. This is, um, you know, there's books I love, um, but I'm not a collector. I'm a reader. Um, and I've put together libraries, a, a library filled with books that I love and authors that I love, you know, Dickens and Shakespeare. I've got a whole bunch of, you know, Arthurian literature books. I'll get a lot of Shakespeare. Um, so I wind up with a lot of different areas that interest me, but I don't approach them as a collector approaches them. Um, and, uh, so the book value to me is a book that I love. So then it's basically right. like, Ed, what are your favorite books? <laughs> mm. You know, like Moby Dick is the greatest sure. novel ever written. And so I have like seven copies of Moby Dick, um, you know, so that's how kind of how it goes. Um, there's a great, well, to keep it on, to keep it, you know, um, uh, on theme today, there is a great version uh, published uh, book of Dracula with all Edward Gorey illustrations that I highly recommend for people to have. And it's just, it's a beautiful book and it's got great edges on it and all his illustrations. Um, and it's not crazy expensive and, and you can buy it. That's a great version of Dracula to read. Um, and for Frankenstein, there's a great edition of Frankenstein called the original Frankenstein. And it's edited by a scholar by the name of Charles Robinson, who I don't think is still alive anymore. What Charles Robinson did is he took the original manuscript of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and he publishes that. And then all the, all the places in the text that Percy had suggested, because you can tell from the manuscript are in italics. And then in the back, he has cut out all of Percy's editions and included just her text and even all her cross outs. Like they're all in there as like the original text that you can read, like the raw book that she came up with at 18. Mm. And, and oh, coolest wow. version of Frankenstein to read, I think. Um, uh, so that's a great, that's a great Frankenstein text too. I'd also, I'd also be remiss of me not to mention the annotated editions of Frankenstein and Dracula by Leslie Klinger, uh, which are absolutely brilliant and have all sorts of like wonderful information. It, actually, Leslie Klinger's Frankenstein edition is great because within that book is all of, he does the 1818 text, the first edition, but then in the notes on the side, you get changes made from that Mary Shelley had made and published in the 1831 edition and on the third edition and also the 1824 second edition, she made changes in a book, but then they weren't included in the second edition and he's got those too. So it's like all the changes that, that the author made are also in the margins in, the, in that edition. So Leslie Klinger's Frankenstein edition is really great to have. Oh, that's interesting. Thank you. Some great recommendations from our guest, Ed Pettit. Ed, my final question for you tonight. You've got a series of programs coming up on the great series of Sherlock Holmes stories. This is also part of the Rosenback. Tell us about this and if people are interested, how they can connect to these virtual programs. This is all part of our, uh, what we call, we call these po programs Biblio Ventures. And, and we did Sundays with Dracula, Sundays with Frankenstein, Sundays with Jane Eyre, and then Austin Mondays. And now we're doing Sherlock Mondays. And it will start uh, soon in September this year, uh, September 18th. I don't know when this you know show will come out. Um, every Monday night uh, for 30 weeks, actually I'll take a couple weeks in, off of Christmas. Um, 30 weeks, uh, Monday nights, um, with a different Sherlock Holmes story every week. We're starting from the, when the first one he published, um, uh, study in Scarlet, and then we'll finish with, uh, the empty house, uh, which is one of the short stories. And, uh, that works out really well because at the Rosenbach, we have Conan, Arthur Conan Doyle's manuscript for the empty house. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's a great one to finish with, um, 
every week myself and a rotating set of co-hosts will sit down and for 90 minutes on Monday night, talk about a story from beginning to end. Uh, I have some great co-hosts. They're all Sherlockians. Anastasia Klimchinskaya, who was one of my co-hosts on Sundays of Frankenstein, joins me. Uh, Monica Schmidt and uh, Mary Alcaro, who is also doing all the drinks for the show. There will be a cocktail every week um, for Sherlock. And also Curtis Armstrong is joining me. Um, Curtis Armstrong is a really great Sherlockian, and he's written, and he's in the Baker Street of Regulars and all this stuff. But most people know Curtis Armstrong as an actor. Uh, he was Booger in Revenge of the Nerds. And, <laughs> nice. Oh, goodness. And he's still a working actor. He was a new girl, and, you know, he does... He does series all the time now and movies all the time now. He's still work and he's one of my co-hosts. So it's it'll be a lot of fun having Curtis to talk about Sherlock as well. So it'll be a cool series. Um, and it starts on September 18th and will run for 30 weeks. And then you can watch them live, which I which is always fun on Monday nights. Uh, um, and then but they're all available to watch afterwards on on the Rosenbach's YouTube channel. And people can sign up at the website, right? Sign up. Yeah, go to Rosenbeck.org and, and find Sherlock Mondays on there and um, uh, register for it. When you register for it, then you get you get an email from me every week about what's coming up on the show and reminders. And it's, you know, it's really great to actually register for it as well. Ed, we really appreciate your time over this past hour. I uh, had great expectations that you would be terrific <laughs> and you did not disappoint. This was great. A lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. Well timed. Yes, my my you. martini is just finished. So <laughs> it's a perfect hour Mark of talking. Very good. Our guest has been Edward G. Pettit, Sunstein Manager of Public Programs at the Rosenbach Museum and Library. And Ed will be hosting the series of Sherlock uh, Holmes programs uh, starting a little bit later on in September. And that will go on uh, throughout the fall and into the winter as well. We thank Ed for being our guest this past hour. Also, of course, want to thank, as always, my co-host, Tracy Asteria. Uh, also, Tracy is our producer, very important as well. Uh, we hope you all have enjoyed the program. And please join us next time right here in the Ghostly Gallery. <laughs>